present and the future, but mainly the present. What is happening today where we are, you're all dealing with cancer, specifically breast cancer, as this session is focused on this. And I believe that um, we are all dealing with a dilemma whether or not chemotherapy is um, something that is needed or not to all patients. So the biggest question of at least the past several years is whether how we choose the patients who need and who do not need chemotherapy. And the reason why we're having this conversation is because we know very well that when we look at early stage breast cancer, especially the ER positive patients, even if you look at breast cancer recurrence, or if you look at the mortality of patients, the benefit of chemotherapy is very small. It's maximum 10%. And the biggest dilemma that you deal with is how do we separate those patients? How do we separate the patients who need chemotherapy from those that do not need chemotherapy? And why we have because, this? Because, yes. if I uh, just of say a few words. Anything you want. Because we have here not only distinguished specialists who understand very well what you are telling, but a lot of young guys, students. And maybe I'll just point out a very uh, short idea. Mm -hmm. After surgery, some patients had to do chemotherapy, some not. And sometimes it's very difficult to decide if they need or if they don't need chemotherapy. And it's an important step. If you ask 10 uh, medical oncologists, maybe four of them will say, yes, you will have a benefit of doing chemotherapy. And six of them are saying, no, you need just uh, uh, hormonal treatment. And this is a tool, quite sophisticated tool, and expensive, <laughs> and expensive tool. Well, it depends uh, on the politics. Maybe it's free of charge. Uh, maybe you will have programs yeah, uh, to decide if the, these patients need chemotherapy or not because it changed life. It's a 30 years young and beautiful lady. You are doing conservative treatment. She, she has just a small scar. She's a, in, in good shape. She has uh, one, maybe two lymph nodes with metastasis. metastasis. Uh, she needs, of course, radiotherapy if there is conservative treatment. But does she need chemotherapy? Because if she is doing chemotherapy, the life will be not so beautiful. And this is a tool to decide if really she did. Sorry. So, as very clearly stated, uh, this is exactly the point. How to separate the patients who actually <coughs> need chemotherapy, which is the minority of them, compared to the ones that do not need chemotherapy. And to the price, the cost of treatment is also very high, even though we tend to calculate the cost of chemotherapy alone, but there's a lot of other three, uh, uh, costs involved in the treatment of early stage breast cancer. So what we're trying to do is among the patients that we consider high clinical risk based on all the markers that you have, the histopathology, the age, the size of the tumor, everything. In that population, we're trying to identify who does not need uh, chemotherapy. So to uh, eliminate the over treatment of patients. On the other side, and those patients that you see that are low risk, good prognosis maybe, and in that population we're trying to find who needs chemotherapy in order to avoid something that is also very dangerous and costly, which is the under treatment of patients. So the tool to do this is called Oncotype DX and it looks at 21 genes, which are genes that or selected by, you know, estrogen group, which you see ER and PR that we use regularly, proliferation includes also T67, HER2 group, the invasion group, other genes that were uh, discovered during the development phase, and all these are, are compared to the reference genes, and they are all falling into a sophisticated algorithm, and it gives you um, a number from 0 to 100, which is called the recurrence score. 
And this, based on this number that you get, you decide whether or not chemotherapy is beneficial for the patient. Now, in order to reach this point, we had to validate the test. We had to show the benefit of doing the test. So what we did is we looked at no negative and no positive patients, and we did studies, first of all, to prove prognosis, which means what is the risk of developing a metastasis over years, but also equally importantly, if not more importantly, prediction, which means to determine the chemotherapy benefit. So we did all these trials, and in the end, which I will present to you today, these two, we also did prospective, did it with large-scale clinical trials to validate that is, are we able, what the theory says, and what we have proved here, to show it also in the clinic, to bring it. So for non-negative patients, because we have validated the full spectrum, we wanted to see if the patients that have a score between 11 and 25, which correlates to a risk of recurrence between 10 and 20%, if these patients receive chemotherapy or not, do they do differently? So is the addition of chemotherapy giving any extra value to those patients? The patients that had a score over 26, which had an elevated risk and also have proven in other studies that have clear chemotherapy benefit, do not receive endocrine therapy alone, they receive chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. And the patients that have a really low score, because also we had proved previously that these patients do not benefit from chemotherapy. So we randomized these patients. The study was done in more than 10,000 patients, and what we saw is that those patients do not benefit from the addition of chemotherapy. So we see here that the patients who actually took chemotherapy, which is the pink line, and the patient that did not take chemotherapy, they had no difference between them, with scores of 11 to 25. And these are all non-negative patients in this trial. And even if we look at other endpoints, for example, overall survival or distant recurrence free interval, they did not benefit in any possible way from the addition of chemotherapy. The only place that we saw benefit, because we looked at also the tumor size, the grade, all these markers that you use in your clinic, also the combination of them, which is the clinical risk, no benefit was shown besides younger patients. So patients between the age of 40 and 50 are the ones that actually showed some chemotherapy benefit when they had a score between 11 and 25. So when we zoomed into these patients, we saw that it's not all the younger patients, it's 40 to 50 which is a strong indication that most likely this is due to the ovarian function suppression that the chemotherapy provides to the patients. But I'll show you more information about this. Now, for the no negative patients, this study had, took place a few years ago and results are still being reported. And last December, we had data from the 12 year follow-up of those patients. So now um, our medical oncologists are very interested, also breast surgeons are very interested in the late recurrences. So what happens after the five years of endocrine therapy? So now we have strong data for more than five years, which is 12 years, so we take it into account the late recurrences. And it seems that the test clearly strongly distinguishes who is of high risk versus low risk, but also in every endpoint, disease free survival, overall survival, in any endpoint, we see that the difference between those who took chemotherapy and do not take chemotherapy, even at 12 years, was less than 1%. So still there's no chemotherapy benefit, even in the long term. And this change is never significant. This 1% that I just told you, benefit, is never significant in any endpoint. So even though, of course, over time the events increase, but they increase equally in those who took and did not take chemotherapy. So there's no additional benefit. And we still see the same effect on younger patients that I will show you even in more details, where they start showing some chemotherapy benefit from the score of 21. So 16 to 20 is some, and then straight, uh, clear benefit is from 21 and above for patients below the age of 50 only. And this, even at 12 years, we still see the same effect, which it reinforces the fact that this is most likely the effect of ovarian function suppression because the benefit of the young patients is not for all the patients, it's for patients between, between 40 and 50, regardless of menopausal status. Now, moving forward, 
We also had to validate the test, as uh, Professor Butaro said, in non-positive patients. So in that population, what we did is we did another clinical trial perspective, 10,000 patients also, and 5,000 of them had the score from zero to 25. So there also we have to compare and randomize those patients to see whether they benefit from chemotherapy or not. So everybody below the score of 25 was randomized between endocrine therapy or chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. And everybody over 26 took chemotherapy because we have proven that they need it. And as expected, no chemotherapy benefit there either for the, in the total population. And the same as I said before, with the non-positive, it's that there's no, even in any endpoint that you look at, if you look at uh, invasive disease free survival or any other endpoint, there's no chemotherapy benefit. When we separated them though, the non-positive patients by menopausal status, we were able to see that the postmenopausal patients clearly had no benefit from chemotherapy and no subgroup of them did, even larger or smaller tumors or grade high versus grade low, no population had chemotherapy benefit um, in that zero to 25 postmenopausal patients. But in the premenopausal patients, they all had chemo benefit. So in all the endpoints. So when you have a younger patient with a premenopausal but no positive disease, you will know even if they have a low recurrence score or any score from any, any multi-gene assay, they benefit from chemotherapy. And I'll tell you how much to do. <coughs> so you see in every endpoint, you see benefit from chemotherapy. And you see it in all the subgroups in contrast with the older patients, over 50. So here you see that all the patients, regardless of tumor size or age or any, any other, as long as they are premenopausal, they all have a chemotherapy benefit. Mm -hmm. And even if we, se we separated the micrometastasis, and we saw that um, we saw that for the premenopausal patients there was a benefit, even if, even if they had just a micromet, not um, a clear N1 disease. And clearly, in all endpoints, we see the same. And this is looking at their, their menopause. So if they had their periods or not, actually had a difference. So that's why we believe that this effect is due to the ovarian function suppression as well. But nonetheless, the difference between them is strongly is significant, so you have to take it into consideration. Now, in order to answer what I keep repeating about the ovarian function suppression, in order to answer this, we're actually, there's an ongoing clinical trial now called Offset, which just started last month, approving patients. And uh, we're actually taking patients that are premenopausal and uh, with no positive and no negative, randomizing between taking OFS and aromatase inhibitors or chemotherapy plus OFS and aromatase inhibitors. And this will answer to us if this chemo benefit that we see in that population is due to the ovarian function suppression or if it's the actual chemotherapy benefit. Even though all the, the um, data show that it's most likely due to the OFS. Oncotech DX is part of all the clinical drug, um, guidelines international guidelines, and it's not just part of them, but it's also either the preferred test or the only test defined as the predictive marker, which means chemotherapy benefit, uh, proof chemotherapy benefit. So to put all I just showed you in one picture, this is, this is the picture. So postmenopausal or younger patients, if they have a recurrent score below 25, even if they're no positive or no negative, they do not need chemotherapy. Everybody over 25 has a clear benefit of chemotherapy. In the premenopausal or younger than 50 population, no negative, you start to see a benefit from the score of 21 of chemotherapy. And if they're no positive premenopausal, then they all have a benefit, even small, even though small, 2.3, 2.8. But that's a discussion, and that's the value of individualized treatment, but that's a discussion you can have with your patients whether or not chemotherapy should be uh, recommended. I don't know, 2.8% is something that, or 2.3 is something that you would drive me towards chemotherapy use. So just to finish, and to show also the difference between a prognostic and a predictive test, I want to go through this case, which um, is clear, very similar to the <laughs> example that uh, Professor Vidal just mentioned. Uh, young patients, 40, patient, 48 years old, 1.8 centimeter premenopausal patient, 
ERPR positive, HER2 negative, uh, grade two, negative lymph nodes, good overall health, and T6 to 7 to 25%. So let's say this is your patient and you oncotype that patient. So what you get back is a high recurrence score. As an example, the chance of having a high recurrence score is 20% in this uh, the, uh, non negative population. So you get a high recurrence score. So let's see what you do. The guidelines clearly state that this patient needs chemotherapy. So if you use the insufficient guidelines in your clinical practice, clearly it says that. Now, if you look at what do I do with a test like on the it says clear on the uh, last version of the NCT guidelines, it separates prediction versus prognosis. So it's definitely prognostic, so it tells us what is the risk of metastasis, but also it gives us prediction, uh, which means does it do the patient benefit from chemotherapy or not? It is a preferred test with level of evidence one, besides the premenopausal profile patients who know positive that I told you before that um, we actually showed chemotherapy benefit in the lower risk population as well. The ASCO guidelines this year, uh, so the end of last year, they updated their guidelines for the multi-gene assays and they made this, this graph for the first time. So our patient is a premenopausal patient, she's below the age of 50, and Oncotype DX based on the ASCO guidelines is the only one recommended for premenopausal patients. So here it is. But even if she was postmenopausal or over the age of 50, uh, Oncotype is the only one which is orange and orange so that means high quality of evidence and strong strength of recommendation, which is the higher level of recommendation that ASCO gives. Now let's say your same patient did a prognostic test. So same profile, I'm not gonna go over it. And let's say you chose to do mammogram for that patient, which is a prognostic <coughs> test, not predictive. So this is a report I got from their website. And uh, here, if, even though it comes as a high risk patient, when you go down here at number six, where it's the chemo benefit, you see that they show no chemo benefit, even though it's a high risk patient. And this is why um, mammoprint is not um, utilized as a predictive test, because it failed to separate the patients based on chemotherapy benefit. So based on the validation study of, of uh, Taylor X, of, uh, excuse me, of um, mammoprint, this patient is considered a low clinical risk, which means it's a grade two, and it's size below two centimeters. So all these patients are considered low clinical risk. And from their MIDAC trial, which is the validation study of mammogram, it showed that those patients, even though they're high score, they cannot find chemotherapy benefit, which shows that a prognostic test cannot be used for chemotherapy decisions, just for the assessing the risk. And that's why when you go to the guidelines, and you start looking, you'll see here, it says that besides oncotype, which is on the decision trees, it shows that other prognostic gene expression assays can be used, but uh, only to assess the risk, not to show chemo benefit. So you can use it in order to say if there's a chance of metastasis, but not if, benefit, if there's benefit from chemotherapy. And the reason why this is there is because this was shown at the trial. So when they had the clinical low patient, like our patient here, and mammogram was high, then they were not able to separate those two curves and show that they benefit from chemotherapy. So they failed to show that. And on top of this, even if the patient was a high clinical risk, then you see that below the age of 50, all patients benefit from chemotherapy, regardless of anything else. So this patient should not be, not just benefit, but they benefit at 5%, so that's a strong benefit. <laughs> And this is why, if you look back at the table in CCM, and I'm almost over, when it looks at mammogram for predictive, it says not determined. So you cannot determine the chemo benefit from that. And similarly, the ASCO guidelines do not recommend the use of uh, mammogram in premenopausal patients, but even if she was postmenopausal, then it says only in clinically high risk patients, and recommendation is intermediate, not high. So just to summarize, what you need to, choose, to use in order to choose what is the right tools in general, and especially when it comes to molecular tests for you, is look at the level of evidence as physicians, especially for the younger ones. Prospect, if there are prospective clinical trials, and if there are, uh, is the test predictive or prognostic only for chemotherapy? Is, does it change your clinical practice? 
And is it in the guidelines? And if it is, in what way and what's the level of evidence? And this is the only way you can do what all the Congresses, including this one, is stating clearly that you individualize your treatment and you do evidence-based medicine. Thank you very much.